Welcome to another edition of Focus on Alternatives, hosted by ADISA, the Alternative and Direct Investment Securities Association. I'm Damon Elder, publisher of the DIYer.com, and I'm joined today by Greg Moss, Senior Managing Director of Skyway Capital. He's also a longtime member of the Board of Directors of ADISA. So Greg, today we're going to talk about a project that's near and dear to your heart as a member of the Board of Directors of ADISA, and that's a newly published new guide to best practices for Delaware statutory trusts. Uh, designed for 1031 exchanges, which Adisa just put out earlier this year. So let's talk about it. DSTs are fairly new, but 1031 is not. 1031 exchanges have been around for over 100 years. Huge industry. Most 1031s are structured as real estate transactions, but the securitized portion of that industry has grown to more than 10 billion. It has become huge. So why did Adisa feel the need to put out a new best practices? Well, there's lots of new entrants, new sponsors in the market, and the market's constantly changing. And there's new features, new benefits, and we wanted to really grab the kind of the best practices, the industry intelligence, and propagate it out there so that everybody can benefit from uh, the really the best in class way of doing things. And again, it's all about structuring quality deals so that investors have good choices and have um, protections. So what was the process? You know, who's behind the, who wrote the new best practices? And, and what was the process to have a DISA to publish them and to approve them and promulgate them to the industry? Yeah, so it was a bunch of experts um, from sponsors, from law firms, from third party due diligence that came together under the ADISA banner. Um, there's also the AI Betterment Committee, Alternative Investment Betterment Committee, where uh, ADISA is trying to constantly look at areas where they can put forth uh, best practices. But it was really a collection of experts. Okay. Um, so there was, was there a comment period? The, the, the industry as a whole participated in some fashion? Yeah, absolutely. So the original best practices uh, that we published was actually back in 2006. And so it was long overdue. Back for the tick days. Yeah, long overdue for a refresh. Um, and the, the old best practices really didn't address DSTs, which is that's the primary uh, vehicle for 1031 tra uh, securitized transactions these days. Yeah. I mean, there are very few ticks now, but like I said, over 10 billion this year in DSTs. So uh, definitely has become the preferred uh, medium for 1031 exchanges. So who, I mean, I think some obvious folks, obviously the sponsors and, and some of the broker dealers that specialize in DSTs or that offer them to their clients will probably find some value in these best practices. But what's, who else would be interested in these best practices? Who are they designed for? Who will they help? Everybody, the, the whole ecosystem. So the law firms that are writing this, they, they now have a document to reference, the sponsors, but the financial advisors when it comes to sales best practices, the broker dealers when it comes to supervising um, these transactions, the due diligence process. So everybody in the whole ecosystem can, can really read, absorb, and, and get takeaways from this document. Why don't we take just a brief step back because I think maybe we put the cart before the horse just a little bit here. I'm, obviously, you and I are very familiar with 1031s. Anyone in the illiquid, non-traded alternative investment space are probably very familiar with 1031s, but it's still a relatively small part of the investment world. So why don't you kind of give us a little bit on what 1031s are, why DSTs have become so favored, you know, where are we in the industry's life cycle? So basically a 1031 allows you to take one piece of investment property, sell it, not pay taxes on it, as long as you place it into another investment property. Um, and it, you must match the equity and debt um, as you do that process. But it's a way to roll over gains and defer taxes in real estate. And there's two kind of structures for doing this. We mentioned tenant in common or tick, but the dominant is the Delaware Statutory Trust, the DST. And that allows for uh, bigger pools of investors to participate in the DST 1031 structure. Ticks were limited to 35, 35 total levels. investors, mm -hmm. which meant the minimums were very large compared right. to a DST. DSTs can have thousands and thousands, right? Um, not quite that many, but it does allow for a couple thousand in investors to, to be in there, um, which allows for smaller ticket sizes, which allows for financial advisors to be able to put together a portfolio of properties as part of a 1031 exchange. Great. What were some of the, why has there been, again, ticks? Early, late 90s into the mid-2000s became very popular as a securitized medium for 1031 exchanges. 
I think they maxed out around 2006, seven at around three to four billion. Uh, now, again, DST structures have completely dwarfed them and they've gotten enormously popular every year. The equity raise is growing and growing and growing. Why was there that shift from ticks to DSTs? Is DST a better structure for a 1031 exchange? You know, why this massive change and again, the explosion in popularity of the DSTs? So number one, more and more people are aware of them. More and more people have access to them. So that, that's two of the reasons. But the main shift from the tick to the DST has to do with financing and leverage. Um, when you structure a DST, it is a one loan on that trust and everybody participates in that loan versus uh, in the tick days, I mean, each individual of those investors have their own individual loan by a bank and, and banks just aren't doing the type of lending anymore. So it actually um, improves kind of government's control and, and management of the whole um, syndicated 1031. Yeah, the ticks were pretty unwieldy. And then when we got into the Great Recession and you need to do some refinancing and things, each individual tick owner or investor was essentially their own. They could squash any deal of any real material. And the DST, I think, is a much more manageable structure. Right. Agreed. OK, great. Um, so let's dive in a little bit. I was going through the best practices. Uh, there's a lot covered in there. It's very comprehensive. What are some of the highlights? What are some of the key takeaways? What's new in these best practices as opposed to the ones that came out 15, 16 years ago? Well, really, we address the whole process here. I mean, from, from structuring uh, to sales best practices to investor communications and audits. Um, so it's, it's very comprehensive. And what was the need for the best practices? I mean, are we seeing people structuring these things in a way that Adisa and the better sponsors, for lack of a better term, just felt was not appropriate, that would be harmful to the industry? Is, was that one of the reasons why this became a push for Adisa? No, there's just constant innovation on legal structures, terminology, transparency, uh, fees. And so as different companies are doing different things, these are, these are private placements. And you know, one company can't necessarily see what another company is doing. Sure. Um, but eventually there's momentum around some major themes and then they coalesce. And then it's good to capture that and then spread it out there and propagate it. Sure. So when I was going through the guidelines, one of the two of the things really that struck me as really new and emerging in the marketplace are the 506C structure, um, which allows for general solicitation. And while certainly still dwarfed by 506B offerings, they're emerging. They're getting much more popular with, and a lot of broker dealers are becoming more um, familiar and, and comfortable with them. Um, some of the key uh, players in the DST space are raising hundreds of millions of dollars a year we're using a 506C, so that's mm -hmm. interesting. And then also we're starting to really see a lot of 721 exchanges, which are kind of ancillary to 1031s, but related. So kind of walk us through there, what are we seeing? Yeah, neither one of these concepts were really in the first best practices. So it was really important to bring them into here. And so the 721 uh, allows for, on the exit of a 1031 exchange, for it to be rolled up into a REIT, traded REIT or a non-traded REIT. But you take your interest in the, uh, um, in the trust and get OP units in a REIT. And then you become part of a bigger diversified pool. Uh, and in the best practices, it talks about how um, some companies are giving investors the option. Do you want to exit for cash um, or do you want to exit as part of a roll up in a 721? Um, so that's that's new. And it's, it's it's really exciting times for giving investors these options. And in the 506 BC, um, the, the general solicitation of the C also, though, then comes with a requirement to verify um, that they are accredited. Um, so that's a whole new level of, of paperwork and complication, but it's allowed people to talk publicly about securitized 1031s, which goes back to your, one of your earlier questions, allows for there to be um, more people that know about it and more interest in it. Yeah. So let me ask you a question to follow up on the 721. So if you have the option to roll into a 721 or take cash, what happens to that 1031 investor who chooses to take the cash? Do they have to pay the tax or can they then again roll it into another 1031 or multiple 1031s? Absolutely. You, you, you hit the nail on the head. They can take the cash, pay the taxes or move that money into another 1031. So participating in a structure that rolls into a 721 doesn't require them to then lose that 1031. They can continue to roll if they want. Right. Well, it's important that you look for a document that gives you, the investor, that optionality. Okay. 
Well, let's talk about another side of the coin of the whole industry, and that's obviously the sales process. Um, and that's one where obviously best practices are probably very important because sales is where you can slip up pretty easily. So what are we seeing in the new best practices in regards to that process, which again, can be pretty tricky. Well, the market actually got really hot lately and we saw deals coming to market, due diligence being done, marketing being done in really, really compressed timeframes and different firms, um, you know, couldn't respond as quickly as others, and it just became a real challenge. And so we recommend, you know, different gates where the sponsor's doing their evaluation, where they alert the broker dealer, uh, where then there's a due diligence cooling off period, and then a marketing cooling off period, so that um, everybody has the ample time to evaluate deals, identify the right clients, and work them through the process. Well, so Greg, I know this took a lot of time by Adisa and the members of the, the working group who worked on the best practices, and obviously there was a whole process for the industry to communicate with you guys and to really iron it out. So now that it's out there, now that it's been published, where can people get this, the, the best practices? So the best practices are published on the website. So uh, Adisa has this resource library, and there's a lot of great resources, white papers, best practices, articles out there. Um, for advisors to engage and learn more about alts. Um, so that's the number one place to go. But I, I want to close by thanking everybody that really put a lot of time, uh, intellectual capital, um, into putting together these, uh, this, this white paper, this, these best practices. It was really a great combined effort uh, of a lot of people. Well, we've been hearing about it for some time, so I know a lot of hard work went into it. So. Well, thanks to you, Greg, and all the work you're doing at uh, Adisa to try to move the industry forward and stay in the right compliant path. That's always, I think, great for everyone. Uh, and thanks to you for tuning in for another episode of Focus on Alternatives. For more information on Adisa, to download the best practices, and to find a lot of information on all sorts of alternative investment information, go to adisa.org. And obviously, visit thediwire.com for your daily news. Thanks so much.